It is a winter ritual across the province, soaring down a hill on a sled or a toboggan. Well, hold on to your sled because some cities are having to pull the plug on this wintry tradition. Joining us now to tell us why, Stacy Stevens, partner at the Toronto law firm Thompson Rogers, John McLennan, risk manager with the city of Hamilton, Patrick Brown, chair and director of the Ontario Safety League and past president of the Ontario Trial Lawyers Association, and Gary McNamara. He's the president of AMO, the Association of Municipalities Ontario, and also mayor of the town of Tecumseh in southwestern Ontario. And it's great to have you four around our table tonight here at TVO. I always like to uh, quote, go right to the top, quote the best to get things started. And a great legal mind, a great philosopher, and a pretty good comedian will get us started tonight. Roll tape, please. Out of all the hills in Calgary, only 18 are officially designated by the city for tobogganing. When perps sled down other hills, that's where these guys come in. Upton and Downey, undercover toboggan cops. We got a code white in Calgary Southeast. Somebody's having fun where they shouldn't be. Put on the hot chocolate, Marshall. We'll be right back. Let's go! Okay. So we have your friend who was on the sled with you in the other room and he's spilling his guts. I was just on the back. I wasn't steering. That's not what he says. Talk. I want my lawyer. Really? That's the way you're going to play this? You're not getting nothing out of me. Hey? Well, how about my partner here looks the other way and I take your winter boots and put them on the wrong feet? Hey, 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 easy. I've seen what these hills can do to cops. Chews them out, spits them out. Go home! It's your wife, your kids. With degenerates like that out there? I'm a toboggan cop, Downey. Yeah, damn good one. Rick Mercer is the best. He is absolutely the best. Now, this, of course, was a fictitious example, we think, in Calgary. But um, this is the real deal all over the province of Ontario, and we want to get into this. And, John, get us started here. Why are municipalities banning activities like tobogganing? Well, they're banning activities like tobogganing uh, because uh, there's, um, in the legal environment that we're in right now, there's a, there's a much higher liability exposure uh, if someone is to get hurt doing one of those uh, Canadian pastimes. Uh, tobogganing is an inherently dangerous activity. Um, people will do it without the proper safety equipment. Uh, we in Hamilton have 500 parks, uh, many of which uh, have ideal tobogganing environments. Um, it's virtually impossible to control when and where people are going to toboggan. We've had a recent adverse judgment against us, uh, so we've had to take uh, measures to make the public aware that it, it is in fact prohibited. What did the adverse judgment cost? It cost at the end of the day in excess of a million dollars. To the taxpayers of the city of Hamilton. To the taxpayers. Property of the taxpayers. City. Absolutely. And that's considered just something you are not prepared to risk running again. No, I mean previous to that, I mean tobogganing has been happening for years and years. As long as there have been toboggans and hills, uh, we never considered it too serious a risk. We always um, operated under the assumption that people were <laughs> assuming the risk risk when they are when they are doing it and that the, the, the courts would, uh, would agree with that. But with the, uh, the recent judgment, uh, again, it was, uh, um, certainly I didn't agree with it, but it was not in favor of the city, and uh, it's forced us to take a different approach to it. Can you just, uh, you know, without relitigating the whole thing here, <laughs> do you want to just give us the 30-second version of what somebody did, what happened, and Sure, so it was a very unfortunate situation and very serious injuries. Uh, a middle-aged gentleman uh, going down uh, a, a well known hill uh, where thousands of tobe people toboggan every year, uh, hit, a, hit a bump which was a culvert um, and uh, incurred a, uh, a cracked vertebrae and a bunch of extraneous injuries to go along with it. Um, the per judge... Permanent damage? Uh, probably. Um, mm -hmm. Some lifelong damages, uh, some which, which I think were maybe somewhat exaggerated by his representative. Um, the judge in this particular instance found that uh, the city had a, the higher duty of, a, of care uh, stipulated in the uh, Occupier's Liability Act. Uh, therefore, we ought to have uh, prevented that hazard from, from, from being present, um, even though I would not consider it a hazard. It had been traversed by literally hundreds of thousands of people over so the in years. So your view was just bad and, luck. And we had never had 
a claim related to that hmm. bump, so I don't see how it can be construed as a hazard. Well, that's one city. We have, uh, what is it, 444 municipalities in the province of Ontario. You're, the, you're Mr. Amo here today. Is this the way it is all over the place now? Well, uh, you know, Stephen, uh, realistically, when you look at it, I mean, it's not just about the Toboggan Hills, but it's, you know, the multiple recreational facilities that we have, skateboard parks, we've got uh, uh, trails throughout the uh, communities and arenas and baseball fields and soccer fields, et cetera. Uh, the reality at this stage here, what we need is, is uh, it, you know, some good, solid public policy. We need the province to really come to the table and, and to, to put forward some, some real policy, um, uh, good policy in terms of mitigating um, some of the, these issues that are confronting us, and, and in particular on the, um, what John was alluding to, the hundreds of thousands of people that, that uh, take advantage of all of the facilities within the community and uh, because of an unfortunate unfor accident. Um, Can I just understand what that looks like though? I mean, are you saying if there's a sign it says toboggan at your own risk and if you get hurt, tough? Well there should be obviously uh, some responsibility from uh, the end user and it's not just uh, looking at the municipalities and saying you know by default we have the deep pockets and then we'll take care of society forever and a day. To me, uh, that, that's not good public policy. The province has to uh, come forward and, and develop policy to, uh, to mitigate some of those, those, those particular issues. If that's the case, then uh, where are we in terms of providing a lot of those services, recreational services, to, to the municipal sector? Do we say, no, you can't toboggan, no, you can't use this trail, uh, and so forth. We can't be uh, at every corner of every recreational opportunities uh, to be there. Do we want to be a, a safe community? Absolutely. Do we want our residents to be safe? Absolutely. But at the end of the day, we can't be uh, there 24-7 um, uh, telling people uh, that the sign is there. Why didn't you pay attention to it and so forth? That's not our, uh, obviously, uh, that particular um, difficulty that we um, we face on a daily basis but the reality is is that there has to be good public policy developed here uh, and, and the provincial government has in my opinion a responsibility uh, to uh, to help okay uh, but a follow in, up in on that, that in a bit Stacy your view on what you've heard so far um, you know just to respond to what Gary had said originally I think the case that he's talking about the city of Hamilton is really um, an anomaly there was also a recent decision uh, that came out in 2014 uh, very similar circumstances dealing with uh, Leamington and in that case the judge found the exact opposite the judge found that the woman who had injured herself while tobogganing had voluntarily assumed the risk of the recre recreational activity that she was participating in you know he acknowledged that tobogganing is just part of the you know the winter landscape in Canada and that if you're going to be sliding down a hill on flimsy materials whether it be you know wooden sled or one of the old uh, plastic flyers that we used to go whipping down on mm -hmm. that there is a voluntary assumption of risk and in that case the the judge found the exact opposite and found no liability so are the municipalities overreacting in your view I think they are I think it's a bit of a knee-jerk reaction to uh, to one case. Uh, people have been tobogganing and enjoying recreational winter activities for for years, um, and this the cases that actually make it to court, especially out of the tobogganing aspect, are far and few between. And I think it's a bit of a knee-jerk reaction to to unfortunately, but um, is a bad decision for them. Let's just establish off the top, you're not the Patrick Brown who's running for the leadership of the Conservative Party? I am not the Patrick Brown running for the leadership of the Conservative Party. You're a party. different too, Patrick Brown. Too much confusion if I did. What's your father's name? Patrick Brown. This is really getting problematic <laughs> now. Okay. Can you give us an example? Because I gather the, the new, the way this thing works nowadays is somebody gets hurt and it's not enough to sort of sue the manufacturer of the toboggan or whatever. Now people, would you say routinely? want to sue the municipality involved as well? Absolutely not. Um, and, and this is partly with the Trial Lawyers Association and other legal associations. The sky is not falling because of tobogganing cases. Stacy is absolutely right. In the past hundred years, there's only been two successful reported cases. One was the Hamilton case and one other case in a hundred years. But is that enough to sort of spoil everybody's fun? It's not. And uh, the spoiling of the fun, don't put the blame on the lawyers or the legal system because the courts throw these cases out if they absolutely have no merit. 
There's only been two successful cases in 100 years. So the reasoning, if they're going to ban tobogganing or put prohibitions, don't point the finger at lawyers and lawsuits, because it's simply not there. John, are you overreacting? Uh, I don't think so. I mean, my question when you cite the Leamington case is well, then what, what to make of the law when, when one judge can completely shut someone out and another judge um, rules in favor of the plaintiff. I mean, fact circumstance was very similar. In fact, um, if we wanted to dig deep down into it, we, we had a much better fact circumstances for defense. In the Hamilton case, we had signs posted about about the uh, about the bylaw prohibiting tobogganing. Mr. Ugenti uh, alleged that he did not see the signs. He alleged that he didn't know that tobogganing was dangerous. And uh, were the signs well placed? We had some missing, but they were certainly there to be seen. Leamington had no signs and no no public. They have no ban against tobogganing. And there's no, there's not a public awareness campaign about about prohibiting tobogganing. And yet the plaintiff lost that case. Yes, completely shut out. Hmm. Are you overreacting? No, I don't think we are. I mean, I can I can give you uh, a case uh, in in the city of Windsor, for example, a few years ago, actually, uh, a real nice little beach, uh, Sandpoint, and uh, there was a, a a very short causeway. Individual was uh, intoxicated. There were signs there. Uh, no swimming after certain hours, and in particular, no diving, shallow waters. And the individual, obviously, dove in, dove in, fractured neck, and uh, sue? here we are, sue the, the municipality. Successfully? And successfully. How much did they get, do you remember? I don't know what the, the final amount was, but uh, again, it's just one of those cases where uh, what do you do? I mean, uh, it's one thing, I, I know that uh, um, she cited in terms of the, the issue in, Le in, in Leamington and in, uh, uh, and in Hamilton, but uh, that's the dilemma municipalities are faced today in terms of even my own municipality. We've got a skateboard park. It took us 10 years of, of prodding by our residents and the young kids. They wanted a skateboard park. So you gave them a skateboard we park? We gave them a skateboard and? park. And, and so far, so good. And, and, have you got and, signs and, up but, there? But uh, yeah, we've got signs. And, Do it at and, your own uh, risk. We have cameras, we, and, and we put it right next to the, our, our police station, right behind town hall. Uh, so we we monitor the situation in terms of what's happening there. But I'll tell you, it, it, it's it's one of those uh, situations where you want to uh, give your residents all the recreational opportunities. Uh, build the best roads, do everything, but you're always there in the back of your mind saying, uh, you know, we're, we're at a risk. Well, let me put this to the other side of the table because here's Andre Picard writing in the Globe and Mail. He's the public health reporter for the newspaper, and he says, while helicopter parents and overly cautious public health officials often get blamed when ridiculous bans on tobogganing, road hockey, and skateboarding and the like are instituted, the real culprit, Andre says, is a torts system that has lost touch with reality. Patrick, what do you say to that? I say he's wrong. Uh, he has no foundation for it. I, I think uh, if you really do take a hard look and somebody looks at the case law that's coming down, in relation to these cases, there's very few cases. And as Stacy said, this is what the judge said in the Leamington case when that lady was hurt. This is also this the is a judge, action. Justice Carey. Tobogganing brings it with it foreseeable, foreseeable risks of falls, tumbles, and attachments from the sled. He goes on to say, going down a snow-covered hill, in February, on a light piece of material, is a typical Canadian winter experience. Falling off a sled is part of that experience. Ms. Koo knowingly assumed the risk, and he threw that case out of the court. So how now, come the judge in Hamilton didn't see it the same way? Because, firstly, it wasn't a, a court. It was an arbitration that the city chose to partake in. So they chose an arbitrator that they chose with plaintiff's counsel. So it wasn't in the court system. The arbitrator made findings of fact that the city knowingly knew that this was a dangerous rut uh, or, or, or rut in the thing that was filled with snow. They knew that somebody could get hurt and they failed to do anything. So from that case perspective on the finding of facts, you have a city knowing full well that there's a danger, knowing full well someone could get hurt and does absolutely nothing about it. And that's why in that particular circumstance, uh, the city of Hamilton was found responsible according to that arbitrator. John, you want to come back on that? Well, Patrick's going to call those facts, but they, they're, they're in fact erroneous. Uh, I mean, how can we have a hazardous situation when people have been tobogganing there for years and have never been hurt at that location? It was a perfect storm, I'll give you that. Perhaps a thin skull claimant, 
uh, who was on the verge of suffering an injury like that. But there's absolutely, there was no history and no, uh, no reason for us to believe that there was a hazard there. Well, let's talk about the first part of his answer, which is this actually didn't happen in the court system, right. but rather in a, in a separate arbitration system. Mm -hmm. Was it a mistake for the city to go that way rather than litigate no, I, this I in court? I don't think so. I mean, city, municipalities are at a disadvantage anyway because we can't have jury trials. So, uh, you know, we're, we're in fact always tried in front of an arbitrator if you want to look at it that way. Uh, you know, we, it would have been a very similar setting in a courtroom. Um, we both agreed on Justice Fedak. Um, and uh, I sat through that arbitration for, for um, oh God, it was in excess of two weeks, uh, considered the facts as subjectively as I could, uh, sorry, as objectively, objectively. as I could, yeah, mm -hmm. my terms uh, rearranged there, and uh, was flabbergasted by the result. Hmm. Can I ask you, Stacy, back onto the tort system itself and that quote by Andre Picard, d does the tort system, in your view, have no role, no role at all, in any of the controversy that we're discussing tonight? No, I don't think it does. Um, you know, I listen to what the gentlemen on the other side of the table are talking about, and I've, I've read the cases myself as well, and we know the reference to the diving case. We, we hear talk about the municipality's been, you know, hit with this and they are res being held responsible for that, but there's also a level of personal responsibility that the court has to balance when they're looking at the responsibility on the defendants. And in John's example, we were talking about the gentleman who was intoxicated who went diving. The courts are going to recognize that there's contributory negligence. They're going to recognize that there may be other tort fees. There's other negligent parties who are also responsible um, for what happened, including the fact that these are adults who have gone on undertaken the activity, and there's always going to be an argument that there's going to be some sort of a balance between contributory negligence being responsible for your own actions. So no, I don't think that the the tort system itself is as broken as as what. Well, it may be a case that we. I mean, we do watch a lot of American television here. We do, and these cases happen in the United States all the time. Mm -hmm. But you're telling us that our system has not yet been and I'll choose this word badly, I'm sure, infected by whatever's happening in the United States? It's not happening here? No, I don't believe it has been. I think that our system is, is one that's premised on the notion of fairness and balancing the interests that the, the judge is asked to, to look at and considering the facts. Patrick? Steve, and that's a good point. This is not the American system, and the sky is not falling. We have protections inside the system. Firstly, juries. A municipality, you can't have a jury trial. They're protected. That's afforded just to municipalities because in the United States, you get what are called runaway jury verdicts, and therefore, they're protected against that. Number two, we don't have what are called pain and suffering awards that are multi-million dollar awards like the United States. We, in fact, have a cap set by our Supreme Court that the most you can get for pain and suffering is 340000 and that's restricted to someone who's got a quadriplegia or severe traumatic brain injury. So that's in place. We also don't have punitive damage awards like they do in the United States. Literally, the most you can get, even on, on egregious facts here, is maybe twenty-five or 50,000 well, in the United States. Well, in the that's United States. You, 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 you talk about your non-pecuniaries, though, that you, you've developed a bunch of different well, heads just, of damages. I'm just saying we are different than the United States mm. on, on all those fronts. Pain and suffering is capped at 340000 You'd agree with me on that, Absolutely. John. And number two, we don't have punitive damage claims like they do in the United States. Not like it, the States. It absolutely is not here. And we have restrictions that already protect municipalities. There's very strict notice periods. So that if you want to sue a, no, uh, a municipality, let's say in a road case, you got to give them notice mm. within 10 days. You don't get that notice out, you may lose your right to sue. Oh, Another protection. Never uphold that. So yeah, what, what's not what, true. Don't, don't, let me hear from Mayor Gary. This is this is ironic. I think one of the uh, uh, I think it was voted one of the uh, top trial lawyers in in in, in Ontario or in Canada, Greg Mountfortin from our uh, from Windsor. Mm -hmm. And when you say we're not entirely like the American system. I, I, you know, I would agree to, to that, but we're moving towards that. And, and uh, he, here's a quote from, from Greg Mountfortin that really resonates uh, in, in, in my mind. Um, if multiple parties are sued and one ends up being a municipality with as little as 1% liability, it's good public policy that they should make up the difference in what the other parties can't afford to pay. The municipality should yes. make up the difference. Exactly. What's your view on that? It's become insurance. We're, we're the default. We're the insurer. 
the municipality. So and, when in doubt, sue we, the municipality. Well, I mean, uh, right now we're, we're spending uh, uh, in excess of $155 million to insure our communities to provide this insurance. This is Ontario-wide? Ontario-wide. $155 million. $155 million. Let me give you a, a perspective to that. That's about uh, another hundred million more than what we actually put in in roads and bridges, and bridges and and culvert repairs. That's another hundred fifty million more than what we actually put into our, our conservation authorities. But I just heard Patrick say that, in his view, the deck is somewhat stacked against the plaintiffs because you have all of these as municipalities, you have all these protections in place already. What protections? What again? protections? Well, protections that you can't charge punitive damages. Protections that you're. I mean, these well, and, million and, dollar yeah. liability and, suits. And we're Patrick seeing. would tell you yeah. that that we're protected from jury trials, but municipalities will welcome jury trials. Why? Uh, I think the theory in banning jury trials for municipal municipalities is that um, taxpayers would not want to see their money. Uh, being paid to claimants. They'd rather keep the money in the municipality. Doesn't it usually go the other way? A victim gets up there, tells a very sad story, and well, the jury you know, I have, hands them the keys to the... I have the ultimate faith in the jury system. I think a jury is quite capable of making a correct decision. Would what you, like you have, What you have yeah. now with judges is because they have the 1% rule to fall back on, they've become uh, benevolent dictators. They just, they just dish it out. They don't want to see people go without. Judges have become benevolent dictators. That's, that's the role they are in. Uh, th th that's, that's the law that they, that they need to deal with. So we, if, go no, ahead, Patrick. At this side of the fence, mm -hmm. we have great respect for, for our judiciary. We really do. Mm -hmm. uh, and the thing with the, what, what, what my friends are, are, are trying to tell you is we want protection. We don't want to be accountable. We want the law to be changed so that when we do something wrong, we're not held accountable the same way every other individual or corporation is. I didn't hear them say it quite that way. No. Well, that's no, what they're so getting. Well, you need to talk about 1%. They're asking then, for a policy change. Hmm. They're asking hmm. to get rid of joint and several liability. Well, that, that issue is really what they're, they're, they're asking the government. They're using perhaps the, the tobogganing thing mm -hmm. as a conduit of getting at that uh, because it, it, it inflames the public that there's all these lawsuits out of tobogganing, and it's simply not the case. What they're really trying to get at is to get some protection from what my friend has said, joint and several liability. So, Stacy, is there no argument to be made here, in your view, that, um, that says a new provincial policy, a clearer provincial policy, would be warranted? No, there is no argument to be made that it would be warranted. The whole purpose behind, when we're talking about the 1% rule, we're talking about joint and several liability. What that means is, is that if you're injured and there is responsibility placed on more than one defendant, in the normal course, the court will, if they can, apportion liability. You, one party may be 25% liable, another party may be 75% liable. What, what my friends are talking about is that in the cases of a, of a municipality, if there's a multi-million dollar decision, let's talk about it in the context of a Rhodes case, you've got a negligent driver who's carrying a million dollars of uh, third party bodily injury limits. The municipality gets uh, held accountable for 1%, the negligent driver's on for the other 99 if you've got a two or three, four million dollar judgment, the municipality is going to be responsible for paying the entire judgment, and it's up to the municipality to try to collect the, the okay. other proportionate but, share. But tell me this, is there a difference between two people getting into a car accident, one insurance company is going to sue another private insurance company to work things out, versus going after a municipality where if it's a significant judgment, people's taxes are going to go up in order to have to cover that. That's oh, different, isn't it? It's not, first of all, it's, it's not insurance companies suing insurance company. It's one person suing another person. All right, the insurance companies respond. Right. And I appreciate that there's the notion that, you know, there's these big judgments out there and that the liability, that the municipalities are going to be responsible for paying it. But the reality is, is that's what the insurance is for. We buy insurance. We all carry insurance to protect ourselves in the event that we've done something wrong. There's no reason why the municipalities shouldn't be under to the, the same. To the proportion so, that they're liable. I completely agree with that. But, and, and, and Patrick uh, cited the fact that there's not a lot of judgments. He cited two tobogganing judgments. Well, one of the reasons there's not a lot of judgments out there is because municipalities live in fear of the 1% rule. If, if you're in for 1%, you're generally in for a lot more than 1%. And, and, and realistically, looking at, uh, you know, as stated earlier, developing, you know, uh, you know uh, a decent 
public policy to deal with the issue. So what does that look like? Well, for us, it's, I mean, look at the Saskatchewan model or, or what, what uh, actually AMO brought to, uh, to the government table uh, a year ago that I thought it was, it was more of half a loaf than the whole loaf. And it's basically um, the difference between uh, the 1% is that uh, municipalities are not saying that they shouldn't be um, at the table, we're there. Mm -hmm. um, and when, when it's apportioned, uh, the shares, uh, obviously uh, we shouldn't be uh, the default insurer uh, for um, negligent uh, individuals, whether it's an impaired driver with not uh, the proper insurance, um, those particular issues. We shouldn't be the individuals now to pick up that whole tax. But is it your view that if a municipality has signs posted clearly stating that you toboggan at your own risk and that if somebody gets in trouble and hurts themselves, you ought not to be allowed to be sued? Is that your position? Well, I think there should be some, uh, uh, some responsibility uh, for the individual who has just uh, avoided reading the signs and so forth. Um, are see? they going to be 100% uh, you know, held responsible? Um, I'm not a lawyer in, in particular, but, but the bottom line is, is that we should not be held accountable for someone's negligence to the point where we have to pay 99% uh, or 100% of, of a claim. There's got to be some personal There has to be some personal there. responsibility for the individual uh, who upon itself took the risk, reading the signs, knew the consequences and, and then uh, more or less shrugs his shoulder and yeah, I'm, that, the municipality is going to be fully responsible. But that is one of the safeguards that's built into our tort system. The 1%? No, the personal responsibility. There's always going to be consideration as to whether or not, A, worst case scenario is that person voluntarily assumed the risk and you're 100% responsible for your own behavior and your own injuries versus there's just a level of contributory negligence. Can I ask negative. a question then? If, if, um, if, if I walk outside uh, right now <clears throat> with my dress shoes on and, and slip on a patch of ice on the sidewalk and break my neck and you represent me, what level of contributory negligence would you feel is realistic representing me? Well, I, I suppose if you walked out there on that ice and you weren't looking where you were going and uh, you were in a rush and you caused your own fall, you'd likely be found 100% negligence for your own actions. And if however, to another. And then get nothing. And our courts are pretty savvy on that. They're not uh, out there. Yeah, I think they're you're not being disingenuous. No, no, but listen to this. You're being disingenuous to our court system and the way the tort system works in Ontario. They're not giving away free money and they're not holding people responsible if they did nothing wrong. Right. They're if somebody people. did something wrong under the system, they hold them responsible, either wholly or partly. So if your question, there's another example. Snow and ice on, on a city sidewalk. Municipally, it's going to get sued. They don't get sued that often because why? There's a special law in place that in order to sue a city for snow and ice on a sidewalk, mm -hmm. they don't just have to be negligent, they have to be well, grossly you know what, negligent. We're, we're plumb right. out of time here, but, but how come this never happened when we were kids? <laughs> this never happened when we were kids. We never got around to personal responsibility. <laughs> I was <laughs> promised we were going to talk about that. <laughs> it ne it never wrong. happened when we were kids. And, 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 and you know what? Lawsuits aren't happening today in relation to pocketing. They're okay. not. I wish we had, guys, I wish we had more time, but that's it. That's all we got. We did talk about personal responsibility. <laughs> Stacy Stevens, good of you to be here from Thompson Rogers. Gary Thank McNamara you. from AMO and the mayor of Tecumseh in southwestern Ontario. John McLennan from the city of Hamilton and Patrick Brown from the Ontario Trial Lawyers Association, past president. Thanks, everybody. Thank you for having Thank us. You. Thank you. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.